والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم إني أعوذ بك أن أضل أو ضل أو أزل أو زل أو أظلم أو أظلم أو أجهل أو يجهل علي الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة إن شاء الله what I would like to talk about is something that I think can't be limited to the topic of the title of the talk. Uh, so I want people to bear with me if you came for a talk about family life in Islam. What I would like to talk about is deeply related to family life in Islam, but at the same time I think it will transcend maybe some people's expectations of what a talk entitled family life in Islam would be about. I want to begin first of all by saying that if we look at human society in the present time, we have to admit that the human being as a species is in deep crises. In fact, this crisis is so great there are already people heralding the end or the possible end of, of the human species on earth. There are people uh, doing so as who are already predicting the unsustainability of the biosphere itself that if we continue on the course that we were on that the earth itself will not be able to sustain human life and these are no longer uh, theoretical debates but rather very serious concerns of scientists and concerned citizens all over the world now in human societies and civilizations there is something central whether we deal with aboriginal cultures or whether we deal with the most advanced civilizations of human societies. And the most fundamental unit of the human being, which is basically analogous to the human cell itself within the body, is the family. If we look at the human body as a, uh, an aggregate of cells that make up a totality, that enables the human being to exist, if the cells become diseased, the body has an immune response and it will isolate the disease to the best of its ability. For instance, white cells will surround an infectious area, produce pus, and eventually either overcome the infection or be overcome by the f infection. It becomes systemic and the body itself dies. People die from massive infections. Now, in Islamic law, the preservation of the family is really probably the singular most essential feature. If we look at the mahfuzat in the sharia, in what's called usul, there are six things that the usuliyun have agreed upon that the basis of Islamic law is there to preserve and protect. The first one being deen itself. The first one being the deen itself, in other words, the relationship between the individual and the creator, but also the relationship between the individual and created things. And this is clarified in the Islamic classification of what are termed in, in the language of the fuqaha, of the jurisprudence, al-ibadat wal-mu'amalat. The ibadat are those things that concern the human relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mu'amalat are those things that concern the human relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So the first is the preservation of deen itself. No human society historically has ever been sustained without a religion. No human society has ever flourished without religion. The, those people who have studied human civilizations, most of them have come to the conclusion that the human being is what they term homo religiosus. In other words, the human being is literally a religious being. The human being needs religion. The, if you take functionalist sociology, they will admit that religion is an essential element in human society. It's only recently that really religion has been questioned 
as a useful aspect of human societies and civilizations. But Islam looks at a much broader idea. The deen itself, the idea of deen, transcends what we would normally consider religion in the uh, Judeo-Christian and the Islamic perspective or even Hinduism and moving into the Asian uh, philosophical types of religions. Islam sees that religion is the way in which one lives their life. That a deen is literally a way of being in the world. And every human being will follow a certain pattern or form. They cannot escape this reality. Human beings, unless they are deeply disturbed at the psychological level, such as schizophrenics and these types of people, unless they are deeply disturbed, they will follow certain patterns. And these patterns are what we, as Muslims, perceive as deen. The mushrikun had a deen, despite the fact that they had, in fact, an extremely primitive, quote-unquote, religious structure prior to the advent of Islam as the final revelation to humankind. Now this deen is to be preserved in the sense that Islam not only recognizes the preservation of Islam, but it also recognizes the right of other human beings to preserve their religious structures. And this is extraordinary in the history of religion. You will not find this in the history of religion outside of Islam. The Muslims give the right to the Jews, the Christians, the fire worshippers, and according to Imam Malik, even the Mushrikeen, the right to raise their children, to build institutions, to maintain their religious structures, to maintain their religious beliefs despite the fact that the Muslims do not believe that they are sound ways of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is an extraordinary uh, advancement in the, the uh, experience of the human species on earth. The Christians have never had anything near this. In fact, the tolerance of the Western Hemisphere is a result of the abandonment of Christianity. They do not like to admit this, but the reality of it is, Islam is only allowed here on this uh, island, in the United Kingdom, or in the United States, because of the abandonment of Christianity as a state apparatus. It began with the separation of church and state, which was a Masonic, uh, it was a, Maso a Masonic goal of the Freemasons to completely separate religion from state affairs. They succeeded in doing this and for this reason mosques are allowed to be built and people are allowed to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the United Kingdom. During the time in which the Christians were in control in this country and the king truly was the quote unquote defender of the faith, Muslims would not allow to worship in this land. In fact, they would have probably been killed. Jews themselves, who were close to the Christians, were expelled several times during different pogroms in the uh, religious history of this island. It was Oliver Cromwell that brought the Jews back and firmly established them both economically and religiously in this country after their expulsion prior to that. So this is an extraordinary achievement of Islam. The next thing that Islam recognizes is the preservation of life, which is moving, if this is still within the individual realm, but also has societal implications. You have in retribution life itself. So the, I, I would request the children that are crying, it, I, it's very hard to concentrate, and uh, I, I, need, I need some, I can't concentrate. You know, this is a, a, one of the extraordinary things about Muslims is that we, we don't uh, do things like just have a, a nursery where, you know, there's babysitters and things like that. I mean, it's very simple solutions to these type of, where sisters can come, benefit from the talks, and do, I mean, it's just, it's just logic. It's very simple, rational solutions to very simple problems. <laughs> You know, but, but we, we unfortunately, we're, we're, we're like the 12 steppers, one day at a time, <laughs> one idea at a time. <laughs> so, and we keep reinventing the wheel for some reason. So, where, where was I? I'm going to ask you to... <laughs> preservation of life. Preservation of life. This is the next thing that the religion of Islam preserves, not only amongst the Muslims, but amongst other peoples. Other religion is extraordinary accomplishment. 
in human history is that we literally preserve the life of those living under an Islamic rule and they are called Dhimmiyun. The people of Dhimma are literally mean the people of responsibility. In other words, the Muslims are responsible for their well-being. The Muslims are responsible for their well-being. Omar ibn al-Khattab saw a Jewish man in his old age begging in Sham. And he said, SubhanAllah, we used to take from them the jizya when they were old, and now that they can't work anymore, they have to beg. And he said, this is unjust. And so he established from the Bayt al-Mal that non-Muslims would literally be recipients of welfare of the state in order to take people off the streets of begging. It's an extraordinary phenomenon in, in the history of human civilization. We have to recognize this. So the preservation of life itself, that the human being has the right to life, that his life is sacred. The nafs itself is derived from the word nafusa yanfusu, fa'uwa nafis. It, it comes from a word which means precious. Human life is precious. One of the signs of the end of time is that life, blood would have no value. Blood, human blood would have no value. Would, the people would spill blood with impunity. And this is taking place all over the earth. And Islam sees that killing one life is as if you have killed the entire humankind. I, really, it's phenomenal. The human life, the preservation, the right of human beings not only to worship as they see fit, but their worship is preserved by the Islamic legislation. Their life is preserved unless they forfeit that right to live amongst human beings by taking life or by destroying the foundation of the social order which is the marital relationship and this is the zani and mahsan, the married fornicator you see, not the zani who is not married the zani who is married because this, he, he has his outlet or she has her outlet for her sexual passions or his sexual passions, the shahawat. But if they breach that by going out, وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْعَادُونَ Those people who go outside of the hudud of Allah, they are the transgressors. And adun is from a word which means to be infectious. Al-adwa is infection, so that corruption in the human society infects people. Fornication infects human societies. It breaks down human societies so that the immune system can no longer preserve the social order. And you have this breakdown all over this country, the United States, Western Europe, and it's spreading all over the world because of this dynamic monoculture of kufa. What Carter called the culture of disbelief. This is what this Stephen Carter, who's an American intellectual from Princeton University, wrote a book called The Culture of Disbelief. If you interpret that into Arabic, Hadarat al Kufar. That is how you attract. So their own people are admitting the degree of depravity that they have arrived at. And in this book, he states that in, in these secular societies, we allow people to have God as a hobby, something you do in your garage. But woe unto you if you take the idea of God or morality based on religious principles out into the human society and demand certain standards of behavior for human beings in order to maintain the social fabric of the society. The next principle of preservation is the, after you have the nafs or haya of life itself, is the nasab of the human being which is the lineage. Now this is essential to family structure, is that we know who we are and where we are from. One of the great crimes against humanity that was perpetrated on an entire continent was the slavery of the 19th century, the 18th and 19th century in which people were uprooted from their societies in particularly West Africa, taken to a completely foreign country. 60% of them were done by merchants from this city, Liverpool, the heart of darkness by all these good upright Christians putting 400, sometimes 400 people into the hulls of ships in which many of them died. One out of 12 it's estimated, and there's higher estimates, died on this uh, journey, the Great Passage. And then they were sold for things like rum and sugar and ginger. Then they were deprived of their names. They were literally, their names were taken from them. They were separated from their families. They lost their identities. This is why Malcolm X, Malik Shabazz, the great Shaheed of America, took the name X, because X in the mathematical symbol, the language of mathematics, is for the unknown. 
And what he was indicating there is that he did not know who he was. And a human being has the right to know who they are. They have the right to know who they are. And to take away that right is to, to deprive somebody of something so basic and so essential that it is a crime against the society. This is why fornication is prohibited, prohibited in Islam with the strongest of prohibitions. It's placed in the sab'a mubiqat, the seven destructive things they destroy human societies. The first is shirk with Allah, and then qatr and nafs, killing human beings, and fornication, and disrupting the parental uh, relationship, the hierarchical relationship of a child with his mother and father. This, this spread of, of fornication in societies is so destructive. There's children in this culture who don't know who they are. They don't know who their fathers were. The rage and anger that literally boils up in these people is so phenomenal. The Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim of Imam Ahmed said, إِذَا فَشَى أَوْلَادُ زِنَا فِي قَوْمٍ يُوشِكُوا أَنْ يَعُمُّهُمْ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ If the children of illegitimate relationships spread amongst the people, they should prepare themselves for the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the punishment, wallahu ta'ala a'lam, is when those children reach puberty. Because they are the most destructive forces in terms of the social fabric. If you want to know who's committing the crimes out in this culture now, who's robbing people, who's taking lives, who's dealing drugs, who's taking those drugs, you will find a very large percentage are from illegitimate relationships of the 1960s and 70s, and it continues on. In the United States, they are almost at the 50% mark of illegitimate children. This is something Islam recognizes the marriages of all of the religious traditions. If two Christians become Muslim, they do not have to renew their marriage contract. Because this is a sacred bond that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human society through the prophets. Religion is the, is the institutor of the marriage bond between peoples. Even aboriginal peoples who are the fitra people, who do not have structured religions, recognize the sacred bond of marriage. You can go to the aboriginal peoples of South America and Australia and find people bound in marriage who have no religious tradition to speak of other than their own fitra understanding of existence. They recognize the taboos of fornication. Islam then preserves the irb of a human being, the preservation of irb, the honor of an individual. It is prohibited in Islam to speak ill of Muslims, both ghiba and namima and qaf. One of the most stringent and difficult things in Islam is to prove a crime. You need two just witnesses for the vast majority of situations within the Islamic Sharia and four for the act of fornication that witness penetration of two individuals. An almost impossible, if not impossible in reality situation, it never occurred during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu although people were whipped for falsely accusing people, and the false accusation goes without four just witnesses. So if two people saw it, that is still considered by Islamic Sharia false accusation. And they're punished for it because human beings have an honor. And when you expose and dishonor individuals, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you follow the faults of each other, you will destroy of sattanas, you will corrupt people. Why? Because the room for tawbah is always open for individuals. But if you go around spreading, if you see a Muslim drinking, and then you go around spreading that amongst other Muslims, and he gets a reputation for drinking, his reputation is ruined in the community and then he has no, there's no reason to make tawbah as far as he's concerned. If, if that is the rada, which is an important element, if that is the element that is, 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 is in his cognition that he wants to maintain his irr. And there are people that, that are more shy of people than they are of Allah and that is not a bad thing, it is still a good thing. Because haya is the khuluq of Islam. So when you expose the faults of Muslims, you are literally corrupting the society. And this is why the mu'man, يَعْتَذَرَ الْمُسْلِمْ وَلَوْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً The Muslim will seek the excuses for the Muslim up to even 70 times, and 70 in the Arabic language means he just keep looking for excuses. Doesn't mean you reach 69 and you go give him a warning, one more time you're in trouble. 
It literally, they just keep looking for excuses for their brother. But the munafiq, the hypocrite, yaltamis, he seeks out the faults of his brothers. This is the munafiq and it's a sickness. في قلوبهم مرض. And we have become an ummah of nifaq. We don't like to talk about this, we don't like to admit this, but we have become an ummah of nifaq. We spend our time speaking ill of others, exposing the faults of our brothers. People have told me the worst thing, I said, taqillah. I don't want to hear these things. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want to hear bad news. One of the salaf, a man came to him and said, you know what so-and-so says about you? And before he could finish, the man said to him, didn't Shaitan find anybody but you to bring me this news? <laughs> this is the type of people these were, you see, really. But now, no, oh really, what? Then what did he say? And then what happened? That's the Muslim of today. So preservation of ill, the preservation of property, the human beings have the right to possess property and their property is protected and preserved and defended by the Muslims and this includes the non-Muslims as well that we defend the properties of non-Muslims I mean this is the foundation of our religion is for the benefit, the maslaha of individuals now having said all of that Jazakallah what I would like to do inshallah is look a little bit of, at where we are and then and I don't want to dwell on it too much because one it's a depressing topic and two most of us really have good critiques Muslim we make the best armchair critics really we should all have television programs just sit around and criticize because people like to listen to it that's what a lot of TV is about there is a hadith that Al-Bayhaqi relates that is quoted often by the scholar that the Prophet Sallallahu said يَحْمَلُ هَذَا الْعِلْمِ مِنْ كُلِّ خَلَفٍ عُدُولُهُ This knowledge, which is the knowledge of the deen is carried in every generation by the just people يَنْفُونَ عَنْهُ They... They... Nullify They nullify the actions of the Alim, those excessive people, Tahrif al Ghalim, who make excessive interpretations of Islam and move to an excess. Wintihal al Muqtilin, and the, the omissions of those who would like to make null and void the deen of Islam. Intihal al Muqtilin, with Ta'wil al Jahilin and the interpretations of the ignorant people. This is the role of the educated Muslim, is to preserve the deen for the next generation. There should be from amongst us an ummah. The, the older ulama, the vast majority of them, of this ayah, the min here is litab'ir, it's a partitive proposition because not everybody has the requisite qualifications to make Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar and Da'wah ila al-Khayr not everybody has those gifts and one of the signs of our age is that we have a lot of people speaking in the name of Islam and really doing more harm than good and part of it is not recognizing our own human capacities not learning La Adri which was a traditional knowledge that was taught in the schools how to say I don't know Imam Malik said it was half of knowledge. It used to be something people learned. And it was a sign that somebody was rightly guided, that they said, I don't know. And now, you'd be hard pressed to find a Muslim that'll say, I don't know. If you look at each one of these categories, the categories represent the three possible ways in which human beings go astray. The first way in which human beings go astray is in the hadith of the Prophet Kullu mawludin wurida ala al-fitra Every newborn is born according to the inherent nature of the human being Al-fitra Allah is fatiru samawati wal ard Fatir means the originator Fitra is the aboriginal nature of the human being 
We come from Bani Adam. Adam alayhi salam was upon the fitrah. But we have a capacity and a propensity to deviate, to, to diverge from the fitrah of the human being. This is a human uh, propensity. What Islam and all of the prophets come is to renew this fitrah way, this deen al-hanif, which is the inclination to the truth. The hanif is the one who inclines towards the truth when others are deviating towards falsehood. When they deviated, Allah deviated them. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِي قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا Oh Allah, do not deviate our hearts once we have been guided. Which is an indication that the individual can be guided and then lose his guidance. Allah says, فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطْرَ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهَا This is the fitra, the inherent nature of the human being that Allah has created the human being upon. لا تبديل لخلق الله this la here is called la nahi. It is a prohibitive la. Allah is saying, do not change the nature of Allah, as opposed to a la nafi in the Arabic language, which would negate the possibility of change. It is actually confirming the possibility of change that the fitrah of the individual can be changed and altered and transformed. We have the ability to go from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He created us fi ahsini taqweem. We were created in the highest stature. This is the fitrah. Now the, the child, I want to move now to the child. The Muslim is somebody that is concerned about the child before the child is conceived. Before the Muslim marries, both man and woman. The Prophet sallallahu said in two hadiths, one is indicative of the, uh, the concern of the woman and the father of the woman. For the, the youth that comes, or the man that comes, to ask for the hand of the woman. And the other is concerned with the man who is seeking a spouse in this life. The first hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا جَاءَ مَنْ يُرْضِيكَ دِينُهُ وَخُلُقُهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ When somebody comes to you, who you are content with his khuluq, his character, and his deen, فَزَوِّجُوهُ Then marry him to your daughter. وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا and if you do not do this, this is a warning from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There will be tribulations and corruption widespread. We don't, we don't take these, these messages. All over the Muslim world, if a religious person comes, there are Muslims that will marry their child to a drunk, materialist, secularist, before he will marry her to a religious Muslim. Why? Because he has a degree, because he has a, 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 a good job and he's making money. He gives his, the, the, the kebid, the, the liver of his being, his own daughter. The Prophet ﷺ said, Fatima tu bab'atum minni. Fatima is a piece of me. And who did he give it to? To a hatab. That's what Sayyidina Ali was. He was a wood collector in the city of Medina. He couldn't even afford the dowry. He had to borrow money for the dowry of his wedding. There were people in Medina that had millions of dollars in relation to the time we're living in now. The Prophet did not marry them to those people. He did not marry his bud'ah, the, 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 the piece of his own, his own flesh and blood. He put her in the hands of the most righteous man in that city, Sayyidina Ali, karramullahu wajib. This, this, is the, this is the example, لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. For who? لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْسُ الله. The one that desires Allah, not dunya. You have in Fir'aun a good example if you want dunya. You have in the Haman and Qarun. They're the, the bad examples if you want the dunya. But if you want the akhirah, and if you want the akhirah for your children, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi says, the, the Qadi, not the, the philosopher, the Qadi from Spain says, the Muslim is more concerned about the fire of the next world for his child than he is about the fire of this world. And look, what will you do, any of you who have children, if you see your child running to the fire of this world, what will you do to prevent them from getting there? You will do anything in your power anything in your power to prevent them. And yet the neglect of our children is beyond belief. We marry our children to Fusaq because they have dunya, they have nasab, they're from the same tribe, they're from the same culture, they're from the same family. 
And we don't look at this hadith. So that is for the woman. For the man, the Prophet ﷺ said, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعِنْ A woman is married for four reasons. لِمَالِهَا For her wealth. And some of the ulama said that is the way that the Jewish religion is more concerned with. وَلِجَمَالِهَا For her beauty. And some of them say that that is the way the Christians are more concerned with. وَلِنَسَبِهَا And for her lineage. And that is the concern of the Jahili Arabs. وَلِدِينِهَا فَغْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَكَ The Prophet ﷺ said, one of the Sahaba said that the Prophet did not know any good except he told us what it was. حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ He's covetous, he's careful, he's concerned about this Ummah. And this is his advice to the Ummah. فَغْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَكَ Take the one who has been, because if you want the next generation to take this religion, then your women must be righteous women. These are the examples of the Prophet's life. So our concern for our children precedes marriage. We're already thinking. It's the Shahwani Yun, it's the people of Shahwat that can't think beyond today. They follow their farj and their button, their genitals and their stomachs. Where they direct them, they go. The one that promises me what's between his two jaws and between his two thighs, I guarantee for him Jannah. And this is an age of shahwani yun. This is an age of just gross depravity. Look at this city of London. Look at the, the level that people have fallen to. Unbelievable. Beyond, beyond belief. Really. I mean these people really vying with the Romans in their depravity. And what happened to the Romans will happen to them because that's the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless something happened. I'm hoping in the same way the Romans took Christianity, these people better take Islam. So this is the excess. This is the way that human beings go astray, in excess. In shahwat, in all of these things, and excess is in religion. Iyakum wal fi deen. Beware of excess in deen, in religion itself. لَنْ يَشَدَّ دِينَ حَدُونِ اللَّهِ غَلَبَ فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا In Sahih al-Bukhari, this deen, no one will go to an excess in this deen except the deen will overcome him, destroy him. So be upright and come as close as you can. Don't become neurotic. There is a type of religiosity that is closer to neurosis than ibadah. The next way that individuals go astray is through omission. Instead of being excessive, they, they, they don't do anything. They omit. Now if you look at the excessive people, the dominant form within, and I'm talking at the archetypal level, I'm not talking about individual, I'm talking about archetypal level. The dominant form of excess is embodied in the Christian phenomenon, which is to go to excess about Isa. لَا تُطْرُونِ كَمَا أَطْرَةَ النَّصَارَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ don't speak about me in excess like the Christians did about Isa, the son of Mary. Say the slave of Allah and his messenger. Say the slave of Allah and his messenger. Allahu Akbar. The Prophet protected us from these shirk of these people, from these excesses. The next way that people go astray is through aberration, aberrant behavior, like a mutadabdib. And this is embodied in the munafiq, who goes between two extremes like this. He goes between omission and excess. And this is embodied in the hadith, the first people that the Prophet talked about were the Yahud, who omit. They know the truth and they don't practice it. Now the Yehud, as an archetype, can fall into the Christian mold, which is to go to excess. They have their religious fanatics, but they're the minority amongst them. The vast majority, if you go to Israel, 80% of these people don't even believe in God. Or more. Really. They're complete omission. But you do find amongst them religious fanatics that are extremists in their religion. Now with the, the next one is كُلُّكُمْ كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ وُدِدْ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ وَإِنَّمَا أَبَوَاهُمْ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ 
to make them Jews. We make our children into the Jewish archetype. It doesn't necessarily mean, the hadith does not necessarily mean that you, that, because the Muslims can do that. We can turn our children into this archetype of the Jew, which is to omit their religion, to forget it altogether, to forget Allah. And we've got a lot of Muslims in the Jewish mold. And we did that to them. There's a lot of Muslims that are in the Jewish mold. The Prophet said, my ummah is the closest to Bani Israel. It's a sound hadith. Ummati ashbahu bi Bani Israel. My ummah is the closest to Bani Israel. Why? Because we know the truth and we don't act according to it. And this is the people maghdubi alayhim. The people that incur the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The faqih who, who knows the rules and doesn't act by them, it's worse than the ignorant one who's the, who, who loves Allah. You see, that's why the Christian is closer to the Muslim. The Christian can become Muslim much easier than the Jew. One of the meanings of dalin in Arabic is dal means to be in love. fahada is one of the commentaries. Dal means balala is a type of love. Because when, when you fall in love, you, like Layla and Majnun, Majnoon, he's just walking around seeing double. Amurru bi diyari diyara layla uqabru dal jidara wa dal jidara. Wa ma al jidaru shagabna talbi wa lakin hubbu man sakana diyar. This is Layla. He's just walking around kissing walls and saying, it's not the walls I'm in love with, it's the one that living inside the walls. <laughs> And that's why the Christian life is a type of insanity. That's why they literally, they go crazy. They start talking in tongues and, and doing all kinds of things. <laughs> if you ever see that, it's pretty frightening. The Jew is rational. He's a rational being. Logical. Thinks things out. Long-term planner. And I'm talking at the archetypal level. People misunderstand these things. I'm talking about archetypes, not stereotypes. So this aberrant behavior is, is embodied in the majus, in terms of other deens, and it's embodied in the munafiq, in terms of this deen. The majus worships two gods, light and darkness. And this is the munafiq, going between iman and kufr. Yatadabdab. This is what he does. Goes between the two. We do this to our children. So now just to look, you know, given that, just as a format, I want to look at the nature. What is a family in Islam? Why do we even have family? I mean, what's the whole point of all this? I mean, the, the, see, these people, their philosophers that say this is just a uh, elegant dance to nowhere. That's what uh, Carl Sagan called this whole thing. It's just an elegant dance to nowhere. We're just going nowhere. This evolution. Their philosophers say it's just all absurd. This is that what they call the uh, the existentialists. Now they're trying to deal with some new way. They haven't really got past existentialism. They're working on it. But existentialism, these people say, it's all just absurd, and you have to create your own meaning in the midst of a meaningless existence. This is what they say. That you just have to find out meaning and then just try to live with it. We don't say that. That's not our deen. Lakum deenukum wa deen. And the Prophet said, La is that a nas yatasa'aluna. Human beings would continue to philosophize. Because that's what philosophy is asking questions. Yatasa'aluna. They'll continue to ask questions. Man khalaqa hada. Who created this? And they have to come back, Allah. Until they arrive to the question, Allahu Akbar. This Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the knowledge of the first and the last people and gave him the ability to articulate the truth of the end of time said until they say Man khalaq Allah Who created Allah? And this is where these crazy people have gotten to This is where their philosophy has taken them If you study in their university they ask this question who created Allah? Is Allah just a projection of the human being? Because we found ourselves in a, in a meaningless universe and we're trying to work out how we got here and what this all means? Did we just invent this big, like Freud said, it's just a big father in the sky? Because the Christians say our father. We don't say our father. They say our father. But the Christians say that Freud just said it's a big father in the sky. You're just projecting the big father in the sky. You see, this, this is where they've got to. They say, who created God? 
And the feminists say, wherever, wherever God is a man, man is a God. <laughs> That's what the feminists say. You see, they say, wherever, if, if God, like Jesus is a man, they say he's God, it must mean then that God is a man, man is a God. This is the feminist critique. Well, alhamdulillah, we don't worship a man. من كان يعبد محمدا فإن محمدا قد مات ومن كان يعبد الله فإن الله حي لا يموت We don't worship a man The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is our example but he's not our God Nor do we have anthropomorphic pictures of God We don't give God the attributes of human beings God gives human beings attributes of the divine, not the other way around. Not the other way around. The human being can be merciful and that's an attribute of Allah, Rahmah. The Prophet ﷺ is called Rahmatan lil Alameen. But not the other way around. So we have a correct understanding of existence and they don't. When we raise, when we, when we are given the gift of children, we are given an amana. This is an amana. Ibn al-Hajj in his madkhal, quoting Qawi ibn al-Arabi, says, Inna sabi amanatun inda abawayhi wa jawharatun nafisatun. The child with the two parents is an amana. It is a trust given to the parents, a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa jawharatun nafisatun and a precious essence a precious jewel fa in awwadahu khayra nasha alayh if he if they raise them and habituate that child to good the child grows up doing good and this is the mu'min we are the people of khayr Yad'una ila al-khayri They enjoin good This is the mu'min is one who calls to good So in awwadahu ala al-khayri nasha alayh Falahuma zawabuhu The two parents have the reward of the parent for every good that he does Iza mata ibn Adam an qata'a min amrihi illa min thala' If the Adam, son of Adam, which means the woman as well dies All of action is cut off except for three things وَلَدٍ صَالِحٍ يَدْعُوا لَهُ A righteous child that is left behind that calls خَيْرٍ يَدْعُوا لَهُ خَيْرًا وَرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا Have mercy on them in the same way they raised me with mercy as a child وَوَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَارِدَيْهِ We have enjoined upon the man and the woman Concerning their parents, we have enjoined upon them one ihsana, hamalatu kurha, wa wabatu kurha. The mother, ummu, the mother hamalatu kurha, carried as a pregnant woman in something that was difficult. Kurh is a strong word about kital. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Who a kurh lekum?" Killing somebody is. A kurf, it's difficult, it's detestable to you. Pregnancy is a difficult thing for the woman. وَوَضْعَتْهُ kurhan, And she gave birth to the child kurhan. وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا The caring and nurturing and weaning the child is in 30 months. SubhanAllah. And then Allah says about the child in Nuqma. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ See it says, وَصَيْنَا Allah has enjoined upon the human being بِوَالِدَيْهِ The two parents, but then mentioned the mother. When the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَحَقُّ النَّاسِ بِصَحْبَتِهِ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Who are the most worthy of my good companionship? أُمُّكَ ثُمَّ مَنْ أُمُّكَ ثُمَّ مَنْ أُمُّكَ Mother three times, and then who? ثُمَّ مَنْ أَبُوكَ Your father. The Qur'an, this is the Qur'anic worldview. كَانَ خُلُقُ وَالْقُرْآن حَمَلَتْهُ أُمَّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ Sacked and weakened. This is what our mothers did for us when we were in the wombs of our mothers. Sacked and weakened. We don't know the, the physiological state that our mothers were carrying us with. Subhanallah. Vomiting. 
feeling like they're going to die. Really. Unbelievable. You watch the women. Watch them when they're pregnant. Your wives. Look at them. Their states. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. Incredibly difficult state. And Allah clarifies it. Wahnan ala wahn. Not just wahn. Wahn ala wahn. Sapped and weakened. Weakness upon weakness. وَفِي صَالَهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنَشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ Show gratitude to me, to Allah. وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ This is a powerful wow right there in the Arabic language. One of the few times that Allah shows musharaka. One of the few times in the Quran Allah will allow anything to have musharaka with him in the gratitude that we must show to Allah and to our parents. Wali wali But the parents have to be worthy of this gratitude. The way that your children will be grateful to you is if you truly take upon this amana and fulfill the amana that the Prophet ﷺ and the Quran has shown us what to do. If you look at the child, the child when it comes into the world is what we call tabula rasa, a blank slate. We will paint what we want. We will literally chisel away and turn this pure being that is directly from the unseen world from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into this world and we will turn them into a Jew, a Christian or a fire worshiper or we will preserve and maintain their fitrah in the same way that we preserve and maintain a johara, a, a, a precious jewel. You don't throw a jewel out into the streets. That's what these people do in this culture. They throw their children into the streets. They throw them into nurseries and let fat, unkept people that don't know anything about tarbiya raising their children. This is what they do. They stick them in for, for a quid and a half an hour. Teach somebody that doesn't even have a high school education. Whatever you call that here. Doesn't even know... Uh, how to speak the English language. And that's where you're putting your johara. So what do we expect? One of the signs of the end of time in Tabarani, the Prophet said, Sayakunu Mataru Qaida Wal Waladu Ghaida. Vain will be acidic, it will be burning. It's a hadith. Vain will burn like sulfuric acid. You can study about acidic rain. Burns, destroys trees, destroys uh, fish, where it hits lakes from all these factories and all these things. That mostly don't fit out. And the child will be filled with rage. Filled with rage. Why is the child filled with rage? Because like Sayyidina Ali, when a man came to him and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Inna waladi ya'uqni. My child is disrespectful to me. He said, كَيْفَ كُنْتَ لَمَّا كَانَ صغيرة. How were you with him when he was little? He said, كُنْتُ أُهْمِلُهُ I used to neglect him. He said, أَهْمَلْتُهُ فَيُهْمِلُكَ You neglected him and now he's neglecting you. This is a just world. The world is a mirror and a reflection for us to perceive our own internal states. The Muslims are in their condition because this is what we deserve. And when we change our state, our states will change. Allah will not change a people from good to bad or from bad to good until they change what's in themselves. The internal change precedes the external change. This is what they call cognitive dissonance which we call nifaq. See, they have all these fancy words, we have simple words. <laughs> so this is what happens. You see, we, the, the, we, we destroy our children. Now what I want to talk a little, why do we have family? The first and primary reason, هُوَ الَّذِي خَرَقَ لَكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُرُوا إِلَيْهَا He's the one who created from you your mates. From men he created women, and from women he created men. For mates, as well. In order to find Sakina. To find Sakina. 
And we have placed between you Mawadda and Rahma. Now Mawadda is a, is a very beautiful word because the, the word really is, does not have sexual connotation. We have placed between you love. One of the the ta'wil al jahilin is that it means mawadda jima' wa rahma al walad. You see this in books. <laughs> mawadda Allah is al wadud. This is the name of Allah. We can be Abdul Wadud. Mawadda is the love that transcends the material, that transcends the physical. And that's why when the woman's sexuality has dissipated in the old age, the love is still there. You see, when the woman has lost her youth and beauty and is no longer has the sexual aspect of her being, what we call ajuz, which in Arabic you use the male and the female, you don't have a, a female form, just ajuz. Because <laughs> it's transcending the sexual element, the polarity. See, so an old woman is called ajuz and an old man is called ajuz. But the mawadda is still there, the love is still there because it wasn't about sexual love. We call that shahwa, which is part of human nature. But this is not what the relationship between a man and a woman is about. Warahma and mercy, there has to be mercy. Now in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we use this word, so the primary purpose of the, of the family unit is companionship, sakina, which comes out of this mawadda and rahma, but also the procreative potential that is inherent in the vast majority of human beings. Not all of them. And that is why the primary purpose of human existence is certainly not to procreate. And Muslims do not say this. And I contend any book that like these, there's some books I've seen about called Women and Islam and where they say the primary, the, the uh, major role of a woman in life is to bear children and you think that. Where, show me what Imam said that. Show me what Imam said that. I mean the ancient Imam, not these modern like me, these crazy Imams. <laughs> The real Imam, we're just a bunch of phonies. That's what we are. The real Imam. Show me one real Imam that said that. The awwal wajim ala man kulli fa mumakkin min nadrin an ya'rifa Allah wa rasulu bi sifati mimma alayhi nasub al ayati. That's the, the reason we were created. Ma kharaqtu jinna wa insa illa li abudun. Wa yaj'alu man yasha aqima. He makes whoever he wants barren. So what? The barren person just say, oh, I don't have any role in life. Because I don't have children. No, the reason we were created was to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that goes for the male and the female. When the Christians debating whether or not women had souls, in the 7th century they actually came to the conclusion they didn't. Subhanallah. And we had Hafirat to Ibn Hajar when he went to Damascus, he had four teachers in hadith, three of them were women. One of the greatest muhaddithin this ummah has ever produced. I mean really, great women. When I was in Mauritania, one of my teachers was a woman, brilliant woman. Well, where are those women now? Really, where are they? See, we don't like our women to get educated. I mean, we have to deal with this fact. We don't like them to get... My contention is, in the books of fiqh, when you come to the wajibat al-bayt, there's a chapter in the, in the books of fiqh about the obligations of the house. And in those chapters it says, according to the Hanafis, the Shafi'is and the Hanbaris, that women don't have to cook. <laughs> we don't want them to get to that chapter, you see. Because then suddenly they say, hey, wait a second. Man, I've been doing this all this time thinking it's wajib and it's just mustahab. <laughs> and then the man says, oh no, trouble at home, man. What's that imam putting into them? <laughs> you see, those imams corrupting the women. Huh? Not getting the curry tonight. <laughs> huh? Seriously. Why do we keep our women ignorant? Muslim men now, they're afraid of intelligent women because so, so many of us are so stupid. <laughs> Seriously, they would just make us feel more stupid. If a woman can actually hold a conversation with us. Oh man, this looks dangerous. She's starting to talk about wajibat and, and taklif and I... Right? Seriously. Why, why we don't educate our women? Why we leave them ignorant? Why are we so afraid of an educated woman? 
But if we have uneducated women, then we have uneducated children. If we have stupid women, we have stupid children. That's a reality. That's just a fact. The Prophet said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْمُرْدِعَ الْحَمْقَى Beware of these stupid wetners. فَإِنَّهَا تُغَدِّي She's giving more than milk. Imam Shafi'i talks about that, of getting a, an intelligent wet nurse. You want an intelligent woman. Halima Sa'diya was a brilliant woman. Read her hadith. They're some of the most complicated uh, Arabic structures you will find in the hadith. Halima Sa'diya, look at her hadith, how that woman spoke, the syntactical structures that she used. She'll run rings around the Quraysh. And that's the wet nurse of the Prophet And her name's Halima. The word in Arabic for, for, for forbearance is Hilm. And the word for nipple is Halama. There's a relationship, you see, between forbearance, which is what the mother is giving the child, and Al-Hilmu Yasbiq Al-Ilm. If you don't have forbearance, you can't learn. Because learning is based on Adab. And if you don't give your children adab, they can't learn. That is why Islamic education was always based on adab. The original word for the Islamic schools were called ma'daba, the place where you learned adab. Sayyidina Ali said, لَعِبُوهُمْ لِسَبْعٍ Play with your children for seven years. وَأَدِّبُوهُمْ لِسَبْعٍ And then give them adab. The hadith that the Prophet ﷺ relates which is sound خَيْرُ نَحْلَةً نَحَلَهُ وَالْوَعْدِدُ لِوَعْدِدِهِ Adab and hasana. The best gift that a father can give to his son is good adab. Oh, come on. The best gift that a father can give to his child is good adab. The Prophet وسلم, said, In al Quran, ma'adabatullah, fakhudu min ma'adabatihi. This Quran is the place where we learn adab. So learn adab from it. Look at Luqman, what he tells his son. Waqsid fi mashika. Be moderate in your walking. Look how the fathers now, seriously, I, I'm, I'm bringing this up. Look how Muslims walk now. You watch Muslims walk. <laughs> Just strolling around like they have all day. And then you look at the description of the walking of the Prophet. It's not for nothing that, the, that we're told how to teach our children how to walk. And if you want to know how to walk, look at how the Prophet walked. He walked with determination. They said he used to, that it was hard to keep up with him. The Sahaba said it was hard to keep up with him. We had a difficult time keeping up with him. We used to wear ourselves out keep, because he was going somewhere. He was a man with a goal. He was moving. He was in progression. He was headed Amam. And if somebody called him, he didn't say what? Like that. He's turned around completely. He turned around completely. You see, that's called, there's a, there's a law in cardiology called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. It's called the all or nothing law. The heart goes all or nothing. It's either going to kick in or you die. And that's the nature of the spiritual heart. You either give somebody all or don't give them anything. But don't be halfway people. Don't give this dean half of yourself. The Salaf used to say, مَنْ أَعْطَى الْعِلْمْ كُلَّهُ أَعْطَاهُ بَعْضَهُ The one that gives knowledge his entire self, knowledge gives him a portion of knowledge. وَمَنْ أَعْطَى الْعِلْمَ بَعْضَهُ لَمْ يَعْطِيهُ شَيْئًا and the one that doesn't, the one that gives knowledge a portion of himself, knowledge doesn't give him a thing. So teaching our children how to walk, and if you're not an example, when, when Allah says, رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنِنَا وَدِعَنَّا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Look at these ayahs, this is siyaq al-ayah, these are mu'jizat. Allah says, Oh our Lord, give us as a gift, as a gift, Allah is a wahhab. Give us as a gift from our mates, our, our mates, male and female, our mates. And people translate in the, in the English translation, I always translate as what? لَكُمْ فِي أَزْوَادِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًا إِنَّ أَزْوَادِكُمْ وَأَمْوَادِكُمْ عَدُوًا لَكُمْ فَحْضَرُوهُمْ They translate, surely your wives and your children are an enemy for you. So watch out for it. That's not what, that's not what that ayah means. It doesn't say wives. It says your mates. Because there's a lot of women that are living with Fir'aun. There's a lot of Muslim women living with Fir'aun. And it's not for nothing that Allah gives us the dua of Imrat Fir'aun. In the Qur'an, when a deen in Fir'aun saved me from Fir'aun, she was living in the house of the biggest tyrant. 
And there's a lot of women in that state. And their, their husband, there's, there's husbands that force women to take off the hijab. I know, this, I'm, I'm not making these things up. There's husbands that don't want their women to be praying, to be acting according to the deen of Islam. Because I know I get these complaints. Well, why? I get women telling me, I, I want to do this, my husband doesn't want. I want to raise my children this way, he doesn't want, he wants them to... So this, this is a this sickness. But then Allah says, give us from our mates and our children the coolness of our eye. Tears of joy. That's what, that's what the, the Arabs, they, they say, uh, That's what somebody said to Hajjaj. You know, may, may Allah make your eye cool. And he meant, may Allah kill you. Because <laughs> when you die, you're, you, 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 you lose the heat of the body. <laughs> but it sounded good. The dua. So he Hajjaj said, okay, alhamdulillah, <laughs> jazakallah. That's not what they meant. That's part of the cleverness of the Arab, like the, the man sitting on the... Hajjaj came up to a man. We all like to pick on Hajjaj, and he had some good qualities too. But man, the Hajjaj came along, he saw a man, and he said, what do you say about Hajjaj, Ibn Yusuf? And he said, a'udhu billah, sharrun min sharr. He's evil from evil. Afsad al-ibad wa kharrab al-bilad. He just ruined all the slaves and destroyed the earth. He said, Atabri manana, you know who I am? He said, La wallah. He said, Ana Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. I'm Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. He said, Atabri manana, you know who I am? He said, No. He said, Ana Majnoon Hari Qariya. I'm the madman from that village over there. Don't take what I say, don't give me worth anything. So we, we, then Allah says in this ayah, He says, imama, And make us an imam. In other words, the only way you're, your children and your husbands and wives are going to be your qarat al ayun, the coolness of your eye, is if you're an example to them. That's why what follows the dua is saying, And make us an example to the people of taqwa. In other words, make us be people of our word and our action being the same. Our word is good and our action is good because children recognize hypocrisy. If you're smoking and telling your child not to smoke, you're not telling them not to smoke, you are telling them to smoke. Because words are meaningless. It's the actions which speak. Like the uh, Emerson, the, philo the American philosopher, one man was, was talking to him once and he said, he said, I can't hear you because your actions are speaking so loud. You see? And there's a lot of Muslims, that's what, that's the state we're in. You can, you can talk all the beautiful words and all the, but in the end of the day, like Malik said, أَدْرَكْتُ قَوْمًا لَمْ يُعْجِبُهُمَ الْكَلَامِ I knew a people that weren't impressed by speech. And he was talking about the Tabi'een, because they knew the Sahaba. And the Sahaba weren't people of speech. They were people of action, ilm wal amal, teaching, not just sitting around and talk, propped up blocks of wood. That's what we've become, an ummah of propped up blocks of wood. And you know what a propped up block of wood is? It's useless. It's not holding anything up, it's being held up. Completely useless. And wood, wood you know what they use useless wood for? They throw it in the fire. And Allah says, كَأَنَّهُمْ خُشُبٌ مُسَنَّدَةٌ like they're propped up blocks of wood. That's what, that's what we become just sitting up against the walls of the masjid, like propped up blocks of wood. That, that's what we're on the propped up blocks of wood. Well, our countries are held up by kuffar. That they're in reality destroying it, but nobody else is doing anything, so they're just going to get busy to what they know best. I mean, don't blame them. It's like the devil says, don't, that's halumuni, don't blame me. That, that's what the devil said, that's his khutbah in hell. He says, hey, don't blame me. I, I, in the I just call, I invited you to the party. You didn't have to come. <laughs> you see, really, don't blame Shaitan. Don't blame the colonialists. Don't blame, we have to get out of this blame. This is Iblis style. Iblis says to Allah, Bima You led me astray. 
He blames Allah. And then he said, look at his sickness. Like Fakhruddin al-Razi says, look at the sickness of shaitan. He, he accuses Allah of leading him astray and considers that bad. And then he says, I'm going to lead everybody astray because you led me astray. You're a nice guy. Right? I mean, that's not the golden rule. So he's sick in his mind. What does Adam do? Adam doesn't blame Allah. Adam blames himself. He doesn't even blame shaitan. Show us in the Quran where Adam says, shaitan made me do it. Shaitan made me eat from the tree. He didn't make him eat from the tree. He just whispered like an impulse. You don't have to follow your impulse. You say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. So we have to be examples. Now, at what time is it? I have uh, a suggestion, I, people can do what they like. I can either break here for about 10 minutes, if people want to take a break, or I can continue. Uh, just because, what's that? We have questions? See, I wanted to get into some other stuff, but uh, what, what, continue or just... Uh, what I, what I, oh, all right, what I want to talk about is now is just we've talked again about where we're at and it's just a bad habit with the Muslims but what now how can we change the, the, our situation what can we do I personally believe that we as an Ummah must begin to think in, in, in long term we have to stop thinking you know we're, we're just band-aid people that's what we do, we put band-aids on hemorrhages. We have to move beyond that. We have to start thinking about how we can actually, you know, make something happen. Now, in my own limited study of Islamic history, what I have noticed is consistently in the history of Islam, when Islam has been in crises, the, what has elevated the Muslims once again out of their crises is education. Now we talk about Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi did not come out of a vacuum. He is a result of madrasa systems that were literally set up 100 years before Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. He is the fruit of work that began 100 years before he was born. And we lose sight of that in our historical perspective, partly because we don't read history, but partly because we tend to glorify uh, individuals and not recognize one collective efforts that individuals, even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had people, Allah says in the Quran, Hu alladhi ayyadaka binasadihi wa bil mu'mineen. He gave you victory, Allah, but also and with the mu'mins. That your victory was also by the mu'mins. And the Prophet was reminded of that in the Quran. That the mu'mins were there to help him with his message. What he used to ask for was Ansar. He used to go to Suq al and he would ask for people, Man yansuruni. He would ask who will help him in his message. And finally, the Aus and the Khazraj took bay'ah with him. This is what happened. That was the beginning of the strength of Islam. This is when Islam, the shokat of Islam, the power of Islam begin to manifest. What we need to do is recognize that our children, that our children really, I personally think that our generation, that what we have to do, if we are to make anything happen, is to concentrate on our children. To recognize that our children must be educated. We have to break this cycle. We have to break this cycle. And the only way we are going to break this cycle is to return to the methodology of the people, of the community, of the, the first community, but also the rightly guided khalaf. Because they are part of our historical legacy. And this deen is transmitted that way. We have to look seriously at the madrasa systems that produced these people that led our societies out of disarray, out of depravity, out of subjugation and humiliation. We have to look at what they did and study these things seriously and begin to implement this. If we look, the child which this gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the individual can be maintained and nurtured and grown with tarbiyah first and tazkiyah and ta'deeb and ta'aleem 
The tarbiyah is literally the material nurturing and the rahmah that's shown. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا The kahir is for tashbiyah. And what that means is, show them mercy like they showed me mercy. Tarbiyah is literally to show mercy. Tarbiyah is different from ta'aleem. Ta'aleem is literally the imprinting of knowledge into the child. The word allama in, in the Qur'an which means to teach. Ar-Rahman khalaq al-insan allamahu al-Qur'an. Ar-Rahman allam al-Qur'an khalaq al-insan allamahu al-bayan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the merciful, the Rahman, the Murabbi, the Rabb al-Alameen, He has taught the Qur'an but also placed it as a sign. Allam al-Qur'an is also to make alamat. And this is what the Qur'an is, signs, ayat, semiotic symbols in which we can perceive reality by. And then He created the human being, Allamahu al-Bayan and taught him articulation taught him the ability to perceive and articulate symbols. We are symbol makers and symbol, symbol interpreters. This is our nature as human beings. One of the most powerful stories is the story of a woman called Helen Keller, who was a woman who was blind, deaf, and dumb. She was born like in the Quran, Summun, Bukmun, Umyun, Fahum La Yubsirun, the blind, deaf, and dumb. She had all three blind, deaf, and dumb. If you read the diary of her teacher, when she first met her, this girl, she was a young girl, already into her seven, eight, nine, she was, I think 10 years old, around this age. She was described as an animal. She was like an animal, completely like an animal. She ate like an animal, she reacted violently, all of these things. This woman who was a brilliant educator, she was a mu'addiba. She took this woman, Helen Keller, and taught her through tactile stimulation, symbols. And then you see the transformation of this woman, this young woman, from an animal to a human being. One of, one of the most extraordinary examples of the human potential, really, her story is worth reading. And this is what Allah does through education. With, we are blind, deaf, and dumb without wahi, without revelation. And this is what revelation is, it's to open up our eyes, to open up our ears, and to give us the ability to articulate reality. This is what we are. But we have to rise above our blindness, our deafness, and our dumbness, and the way we do this is to become people of meaning, to become people of symbols, to become people of depth and substance, to become ul al-albab, not to be slogan people, not to be pamphleteers, not to be propagandists, not to be demagogues, but to be deep educators and educated. This is the role of the Muslim. We are here to take the blind, the deaf, and the dumb and to give them the symbols whereby they obtain their birthright of humanity. This is what Muslims are. We are the ummah that is to take human beings out of darkness to take them out of the darkness of blindness, deafness and dumbness into the light of hearing, seeing and perception. He is the one who gave you, who created you, and gave you hearing, seeing, and the power of cognition, the power of comprehension, the power of understanding that you might give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the purpose of the human being. We are to be people of dhikr, fikr, and shukr. This is our role in life and to take this out to humanity. To be people of the remembrance of God, to be people who are reflective. <laughs> This is what we are to be. The whole of the cosmos is just meaning set up in images. Don't be deluded by the images like these hayawanat. Animals, all they see is the qalib. They don't see the qalib. They never see the inside. They just see the outside. That's the level of hayawan. But we are not hayawan. We are insan. We are Bani Adam. 
لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have ennobled Bani Adam. This is who we are and this is our birthright. And all of this Dajjalic system out here, which is trying to tell people that they were created to eat and to fornicate and to, to dance and to drink, to get out of their natural state of intellection and perception and to go into a deluded state of fantasy and khayal. This is, what, this is what this system wants to give people. They would rather in this country have churches turned into discos than masjids. They would rather have people like pigs and, and, and monkeys dancing than have them bowing before their Lord in a state of humility and awe. And we have an alternative to that. But the alternative takes people. مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالِ It takes from the believers men and women. It takes from the believers, men and women. Sadaqu ma'ahadullah alayh. There are people who believe in this oath that we have taken from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate ourselves and to elevate humanity. But the basis of this is in the ayah, قُوْ أَنفُسُكُمْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمِنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسُكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةَ عَلَيْهَا مَلَائِكَةً غِلَاءٌ شِدَادٌ لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ if we do not become people that save ourselves and our families, we cannot save humanity. We cannot save anybody. If we can't save our own selves and become the embodiment of this teaching, how can we take it to anyone else? How can we give it to anyone else? And this is what we have to do. But this is tekendur. This is mashakka. This is difficulty. It's not ease. It's struggle. It's jihad. It's ishtihad. It's mujahada. This is what Islam is. And if you don't want it, Allah says, that's fine. You don't, don't, if you don't want it, don't take it. But don't play with it. Don't play with it. And don't become a barrier. The, the Muslims in this country, Wallahi, have become a barrier from people becoming Muslim. And Allah says, رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Don't make us fitna for those who are in kufr. Imam Asyuti says it means don't subjugate us and humiliate us by our wrong actions until nobody wants to enter into this deen. And this is where we're at. So we have to begin to seriously think. We have to begin to reflect. We have to look at the people who went before us, what they did in these conditions. We have to create institutions of learning. We have to, we have to, have, we have to get our children out of these school systems because these school systems will completely destroy them. These people don't know how to educate. We know how to educate. They don't know how to educate. And I'm talking as somebody who went through their school system as well as being in traditional schools. I went through their school system. I went through, I went to one of the best uh, private schools in the United States with sons of senators in these things. The best they have. And the best are here as well, eaten in these places. Look at the sickness that comes out, the foulness, the stench that rises to the top of these societies. Look at them. This is the best of what they have to produce. Fornicators, pornographers, sellers of drugs and alcohol. When the riots in Liverpool happen, what do they do? They send in drugs. That's where they deal with social unrest. Where do those drugs come from? They come from, they come from the people in power. Don't think they don't come from the people in power. This is not a joke. If you go to a store and buy a, a, a blue guide, don't buy it, but go look at it. A blue guide to Morocco. In that blue guide to Morocco, there's a little section on where to buy hashish. <laughs> not only where to buy it, where they grow it. Morocco is one of the major distributors of hashish. Now if, if a tourist can find out where they grow hashish in Morocco, you don't know, think the king knows where the hashish is grown? You don't think the secret police know where the hashish is grown? So why don't they do anything about it? Because they own the place. They're the ones exporting it. And don't think Hassan does anything that his masters in Washington don't let him do. Because he does what he's told. I mean, the man looks like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> that, that, that's who's the king of Morocco, with deference to Moroccans. The man, look, and you don't look like Frank Sinatra from living like a clean life.
You know, when I was in Tunisia, there's posters of uh, Zayn al Abidin all over there. He looks like Al Capone. <laughs> See, all you have to do is put a wanted sign underneath it, and nobody would be surprised. Man, who's that? Is that public enemy nowadays? <laughs> See, now who's he would do to him? It goes with the, the Muslims and the non Muslims. Their, their, the, their light is in their face and their darkness is in their face as well. So that's what they do, that's what these people have to offer. And if you put your children in their schools, don't be surprised when they get involved in drugs. Don't be surprised when they get involved in, in dating and fornication. Don't be surprised when they start being disobedient to you, because that's what they're supposed to learn in the school. They're only being good students. That's all they're doing. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do because that's what the whole goal is. What we have ruling the world is a bunch of drug dealers and, and, and cocaine smugglers. This is not a joke. You can read all this stuff. They, they'll even, they're so honest, they, they print it in books. This isn't conspiracy theories. This is just facts that they even let us know about. The CIA is the biggest drug dealer in the world. And, and you can read it from CIA agents that have written books to make money after they retired. Yeah, we used to sell heroin. I mean, it's interesting that when Vietnam was going on, the drug of choice in, in America was heroin. Because that's where heroin comes from. Thailand, Cambodia, they call it the Golden Triangle. It's the fecal triangle as far as I'm concerned. Nothing gold about that. And, and then when the war in the war in South America, the contrast, all, all, suddenly the drug of choice is cocaine. Because that's what grows down in South America. I mean, who brings in, they, there's tons of drugs consumed in the United States. Tons of it. Who flies them in? They're flown in in military airplanes. This isn't a joke. I mean, this is fact. This is the world we're living in, folks. This is it. And the only reason it's like that is because somebody wrote a book. <laughs> I don't have the answers, folks. I'm, j I'm trying to work it out just like everybody else. But anyway, that, I, it's not a joke. It, you know, we have to develop educational institutions. We have to get our children, we have to raise our children properly. Get them memorizing the Quran. Get them learning deen. I mean, our greatest scientists, people always talk about the scientists of the Muslims, these great, brilliant men like Razi and Kindi and all these people. Uh, every single one of them came through a madrasa system. They all memorized the Quran before they wrote about botany and biology and medicine. Really, they were metaphysicians, they were, they were fuqaha, they were hafil. These people are clever. They can take a good Muslim and turn him into a kafir in a span of a few years. And the Prophet said, in the end of time, يُسْبِحُ الْمَرْءُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا A person will wake up a mu'min and he'll go to sleep a kafir. And that's the kind of time we're living in. If you put your children in these schools, don't be surprised if they go to school a mu'min in the morning and they come home at night a kafir. Because that's what they teach in there. They teach kufr. And Ibn al-Hajj in his madkhal has a fatwa أَنَّهِيُ عَنْ بَعْثِ أَوْلَادِنَا إِلَى مَكَاتِبَ النَّصَارَى The prohibition of sending our children to Christian schools. Now these aren't even Christian schools. These are worse than Christian schools because at least Christians believe in God. These people don't even believe in God. They're teaching values clarification and homosexuality is a, a lifestyle choice. And, and uh, Every day, oh, that's okay for you, and it's okay for me, and I'm okay, and you're okay, and I'm neurotic, and you're neurotic, and we're all going to hell, and it doesn't matter anyway, because it's just a meaningless universe. That's what they teach in those schools. So wake up, folks. Wake up. And, and the biggest, the biggest, the Prophet subhanAllah, he didn't leave anything out. The biggest proof for me, that these schools, that shaitan's the principal, of the school. That's what he is. And the problem is not only do they go home, they go to school and Shaitan's running the show and he's a balisa of the teachers, but then they go home and Shaitan's there waiting for them with the tube and they turn it on. It's not for nothing they call it the boob tube. 
That's what they call it, the boob tube. And study, look and look at the people, the movers and shakers in these societies, how much television they watch. The corporate executive watches about an hour and a half of television a week. But the average Joe on the streets watching about 25 to 40 hours. And where do you, who, why, why isn't the corporate executive watching it? Because he's not busy being entertained, he's busy entertaining. He's the one that's entertaining everybody so he can rob you blind and take you to the cleaners. That's what he does, gets you addicted to all these things. You sit, turn on the television, before you know it, you're singing jingles and buying the soap that the commercial told you to buy in the store. That's what happens. Our children learning nursery rhymes and in America it's Barney. I don't know what it is here. But they're learning Sesame Street and Jewish Muppets and all these types of things. We've even got Muslim Muppets now. That's how bad it is. Teaching our children. Say, well, it's better than letting the Jewish Muppets teach them. At least it's Muslim Muppets. I mean, we can't even be created enough to think of something. SubhanAllah. What will be the fate of Ahl al-Fitra, like in Australia and South America, how will they be judged? We're always worried about how other people will be judged and we never think about how we're going to be judged. Don't worry about other people. Don't worry about the aborigine in, in Australia. But if you want to know from a hukum point of view, people are judged according to their knowledge. And we're supposed to go there and teach them Islam. Maybe they'll be a hujjah against us. Maybe they'll be a hujjah against the Muslims in Australia. Just like a lot of Christians here, I think, are going to be grabbing hold of Muslims on Yom Qiyamah. This guy was my neighbor for 20 years and he never told me there was going to be a day like this. How far can a Muslim go in friendship with a non-Muslim? Between two women or two men? The... Uh, Traditionally, part of the Qur'an is creating a psychological barrier between us and the kuffar. And this is a very important thing, really. We have, to, we have to have a barrier. They are not like us. They are not like us. We have to understand that. If you say, well, we're all human beings. No, human being is not a birthright. Human being is something that is acquired. You grow into your humanity. And, the, and parents destroy, I mean, you read the history of these people and you'll know that they're about as far from Benny Adam as, as the apes are. Really, read, read how they treated uh, the Africans, read what they did, the opium. These nice merchants from Liverpool, you know these Liverpoolians, I'm in Liverpool right now and with deference to the brothers from Liverpool, but these characters were the opium dealers of the 19th century. See, they're still doing it, right? Only now, we'll read about it, we won't, but people will be around like if there's people a hundred years from now, they're going to read about, just like we read about the 19th century drug dealers that were in Parliament, <laughs> they're going to read about the, the 20th century drug dealers that are in Parliament now. See, they don't give us the information now, but they, they kind of want us to think that things have changed, we've progressed. See, that was something we did in the 19th century or the 18th century. Those people had religion. I mean, they were Christians. They were being taught about brotherly love and stuff. These people don't even have that. So don't think they're any better. I think they're probably worse. I mean, Kissinger killed a whole... He's, he's a mass murderer and they gave him the Nobel Prize. <laughs> really. They gave him the Nobel Prize and he killed about 2 million people, I think. Is, he's directly responsible. And he's involved in this Bosnian thing as well. He's involved in it. This guy, Lawrence Eagleburger, who works for Kissinger Associates, he was the Secretary of State. They took Baker out, put him in when the whole thing started. He speaks Serbo-Croatian. How far can a Muslim... Anyway, I, I don't think we should... You know, I mean, Allah says... Uh, لم يخرجوكم من دياركم نعم 
Right. Yeah, I know the ayah. I know the ayah. Uh, most Al Qurtubi says it's mansukha. And you can look at Imam Al Qurtubi, and that's what you'll find there. I mean, we don't, we don't make war on people that don't make war on us. There's no doubt about that. But it, nowhere in the Quran does it say, it says, and tuqsitu ilayhum, tubirruhum. And tubirruhum, tuqsitu ilayhum. When Allah yuhib al muqsitin. That you're just righteous to them and, and you're just with them. That's what it said. It doesn't say, tuhibbuhum, wa, wa tuwaluhum, wa. The Prophet said, la yakuru ta'amukum illa taqi. Don't let anybody eat your food except somebody of taqwa. Which is, that's a psychological barrier. You hang out with kuffar, like the Mauritanians taught me, in al-huwara wal-himara in siqa, allamhu shahiqa wa nahiqa. The she, the, the, the baby camel and the baby donkey, if they start keeping company, the camel learns how to hee-haw. <laughs> so you start hanging around with kuffar, and if you're not teaching them, la ilaha illallah, then they're teaching you something. So if, if, if your intention is to give them da'wah, then that's a good and noble intention. But don't, don't start palling around with them and let's go have a pizza and did you see the latest cricket match and, and that's just madness. We're too busy. And if, you're, if you have enough time to watch a cricket match, you better wake up. I'm serious. If you have enough time to sit around and watch the World Cup, man, they should hit that cup over the head, over your head. <laughs> As a Muslim who tries to talk to Kufar, I feel that what these people are most in need of is certainty in two things. Believe in a creator at the point of obeying Allah. That's a good point. I mean, that's what I said earlier that, that these are the first people that really actually deny the existence of a creator. In the Quran it says, When man Allah. If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they say Allah. I mean, there's people that don't even know that yet. Here, they think it's just uh, the Big Bang. Right? Well, tayyib, what was before the Big Bang? And who, and who made the Big Bang? I mean, bangs, if you hear a bang, and somebody says, what was that? Why is he asking what it was? Just say it was a bang. Well, what did it? Well, nothing, just like the big bang. <laughs> I mean, even a child knows that that can't happen. Do you think the current campaign in the West to legitimize and encourage homosexuality originates from a Masonic desire to make society accept their filthy practices? Well, I, you know, I'm coming from San Francisco, and I don't know, I don't know what it originates from, but whatever it originates from, it, it, it's dirty. It's unclean. But, you know, again, give the devil his due. That's a English, good English proverb. Give the devil his due. These people work hard. They work hard. They get out and they, they convert people to their way of thinking. And if you can convert a person to think homosexual, homosexual behavior is natural, and we can't convert them to think that worshiping God is a good thing, man, we, we, we're in bad shape. Seriously. I mean, these people make them think that these things, it's a lifestyle choice. Subhanallah. I mean the Sahaba, one of them when they came with news from Qatar that there were two homosexuals, one of the Sahaba said, SubhanAllah, Wallahi, law lam yunzal fi kitab Allah, ma sabaqtu, annu yasna'u mithra hadha man yasna'u. If it wasn't in the book of Allah, I would have never believed somebody do something like that. That's the only way he could believe it, that Allah mentioned in the book of Allah. And that's fitra. I mean you don't find homosexuality amongst aboriginal people, you find it amongst rats when they overcrowd them. You can read sociological studies where they put rats, like 50 rats, into a small area and they start killing each other and becoming homosexuals. I mean, London, that's what breeds homosexuality. 
You know, you get people living in inhumane circumstances, they start behaving like inhumane creatures, like rats. So, you talked of certain schools of thought. What do you feel about following the school of thought and their authenticity? Uh, we, that, that's a very broad question. I don't know what they mean by school of thought. Uh, the school of thought that we should follow is the one that Allah and His Messenger taught us and, and the rightly guided Imams. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ladina amanu taqullah wa kunu ma sadiqeen Fear Allah and be with the truthful ones, people telling you the truth. And those are our rightly guided Imams and that's who we should follow. Uh, you mentioned six things which are to be preserved according to the usul. Yet how can the first three be preserved today without the baby of a state, with a, a body of a state, with an Amir to enforce? What can we do to reestablish this state? The, before we get the Islamic state, we need to get into an Islamic state of mind. You see, everybody talks about this Islamic state, but nobody's in an Islamic state of mind. And things don't come out of vacuums. We have to earn this thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at the surahs that Allah talks about tamkeen fil ard. There's a jumla haliya when Allah says that wa yubaddilanna min ba'di khawfikum amna. Allah says, ya'budunani wa la yushirikunu biya shay'a. They worship me and they associate nothing with me. In Arabic that's called jumla haliya. In other words, that is the condition which must exist before Allah gives tamkeen fil ard. And as far as I can see, we, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And the other thing, to, to keep our positive, keep the mood up, right? I mean, we have to maintain al uh, khair tajidhu. You know, believe in, in good things and you find them. This is a hadith. And things, as far as I can see from my own reading and listening to the teachers that I had, things are going according to plan. The Prophet ﷺ said to us that the, the khilafah would exist for 30 years. سَتَكُونُ وَالْخِلَافَةُ عَلَى مِنْ هَاجِ النَّبُوَةَ ثَلَاثِينَ سَنَةً Hassan ibn Ali, it was 29 and a half years when he became Khalifa, when he gave it up to Muawiyah, it was after six months. I mean, we're dealing with knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not statistics. Right, we're dealing with absolutes. Now then he said, ثُمَّ تَكُونُ مُلْكًا عَرَّةً And then it will be kings, by holding on to it. With the, you know, for dear life. And we saw it. We had the uh, Bani Umayyah, Bani Abbas, then we had the Seljuks, and we had the Ottomans, and all these. People call them Khilafah, but really they weren't on Minhaj and Nabuwa. I mean, it was better than nothing. You know, at least it's like a, if you have a house with some goods in it, and there's an old man in the house, then the thief walks by, that old man might put him off stealing anything from the house. But if the house is empty, why any thief will go in and steal things? And that's the state of affairs now. At least the Ottoman Empire was like an old man towards the end of its affair. And at least it was something. Even an old man has a kind of haba. But nowadays it's just an empty house. But the Prophet then again told us, and don't forget this, Yushikwan an alaykum al umam kama al It's coming a time when the nations will start taking from you together tada alaykum they'll call each other come on let's go get them like the united nations <laughs> those are the umam they call it in arabic an umam al mutahida the united nations united against what united against the muslims that's what they're united against attahadul yuharibuna that's what they did they got to they said listen we, 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 if we want to rob and pillage the world, organized crime pays and unorganized crime doesn't pay. Like the mafia. You see, in America, a thief who steals a loan, he gets caught, he doesn't have a network, a system. But organized crime, it works. So they get together for their benefit to plunder and pillage, right? That's what they do. That's what the mafia does in America. That's an organized crime. And this is what United Nations, it's just organized. And they're so clever, they say, let's let the Muslims join. Like they're all nudging each other. Let's let, let's let them join and think that, that they're actually participating. <laughs> and then they get up, and then you get the... And everybody listening with their, their interpreter's ears saying... <coughs> that, that's, what, that's 
what they're all doing. They're just there. He said, man, we took these people for a ride. <laughs> Subhanallah. I mean, when, when you have to appeal, you know, it's what Malcolm used to say, you know, that, that these people, I mean, why, why should we go to these people and, and ask them to help us out when they're the ones that help us out from what? Getting rid of them. I mean, that's kind of an insanity, don't you think? To go and say, please stop pillaging us and stop stealing our oil and stop stealing our mineral. They're saying, well, hey, you know, listen, we can't get this fat and I can't drive my Mercedes and my Rolls Royce if I don't do this and I kind of like this way of life. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't really oblige you today. <laughs> Would you please inform us about Islam and Muslims in California? Well, I th you know, alhamdulillah, you, you get an idea of Islam and Muslims pretty much wherever you are. I mean, I don't, you know, California is known to be, uh, the, as the Californians would say, laid back. So Muslims tend to be, you know, they tend to be a little more harmonious. We, alhamdulillah, we're working together and there's positive things happening. Uh, we, have, we don't have a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, people fighting, alhamdulillah, there's, there's a, a reasonable amount of unity, especially in Northern California. But uh, again, this Ummah, we're in trouble everywhere and we have, to, we have to work together to get out of this situation. Is it true that before you get married, the woman can request for the man not to take another woman while they're married? Sister. Uh, that, that naturally, you didn't have to write sister. I know where that question comes from. Men don't want to know the answer to that. <laughs> The, uh, there is a stipulation, in, uh, and uh, you know, you can ask the Imams here to get a fatwa about these things, but in the Maliki fiqh, which I studied, a woman can make that stipulation, what's called la sabiqata wa la lahiqa wa in fa'ala fa amruha biyadiha, which means that what will happen is she has the right to annul the marriage through khala if he takes a second wife. She can stipulate that right. But in terms of preventing him from getting another wife, no, it will just give her the right to, to to leave the marriage if she so chooses. Now the Shafi'i Madhab does allow what they call a secret marriage and uh, that's, that's a valid position of the Imam. Most of the Imams consider that it's highly makru to do that uh, for the man not to let the, the sister know. So if your husband Shafi'i, just watch out. You know? <laughs> uh, I may revert to Islam, my, fa my family are all Christians, marriage is important to me. How can I go about this since I have no Muslim guardian? Uh, I know a number of Muslim sisters, but they are too young to act as my guardian. The best thing to do is, uh, if you don't have any male members of the family, the, in, in, I don't, and I don't know, but Abu Hanifa anhu, allows a woman and tatawalla amraha, that she can take the, her affair into her hands if she's a Rashida. Um, and, but part of the, the reason of the wali, and the hadith is a strong hadith. He, he knew the hadith, la nikaha uh, biduni wali. Abu Hanifa knew that hadith, that there's no marriage without the illa bi waliyan. But his interpretation of the istithna is uh, different from the interpretation of the other imams. So he understood the hadith. So don't think that he did not know that hadith. He knew the hadith very well. And his position is a valid position, valid interpretation, because it's called a dalil vanni. And... Uh, that is a valid position. But the reason to have a male guardian is because, you know, the, the man can come in there and, and defend the woman if need be. And I wanted to talk about a rijal qawwamun ala nisa, but it's, it, I've gone on too long, so I'm going to try to get through some of these. And then I would like to ask you, I heard that when a girl reached age of puberty, their father has to give them away, Muslim man, as a marriage. And if he did not do that, he will be asked in the judgment day. Is that true? I, you know, I would prefer that the fiqh questions be, um, because I, I'm not a mufti. I mean, alhamdulillah, I did study uh, my, the, the madhab that I learned, and I know some of the opinions of the others, but I think it's better to ask. You have some imams here that are very qualified to give you fiqhi answers and so I would rather avoid those because uh, it's just too dangerous to you know you can get yourself in a lot of trouble with Allah because uh, fiqh to give a a fatwa or a hukam you really have to know I mean there's a lot you, you just can't 
I might know one opinion, there might be other very valid opinions. And please tell me if Ali radiallahu anhu was more righteous than Abu Bakr Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum ajma'een. Uh, as far as that, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, the hadith Sayyidina Ali relates, which is in Al-Bukhari, he was asked, Man afdalun nas? And Sayyidina Ali said, Abu Bakr, ba'da Rasulida. Who are the best people after the Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, after the Prophet? And Sayyidina Ali himself said, Abu Bakr. It's a hadith sahih. And then he said, and, and then his cousin asked him, and then who? And he said, Omar. And then, and then the Rawi, who was his cousin, said, I was worried about him saying Uthman next. So he changed the way he asked him because he wanted to say he was. Because he loved him, it was his cousin and he loved him. And, and so he said, Wa anta ya Amir al Mu'mineen. What about you, O Amir al Mu'mineen? And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda said, Ma ana illa rajulun min al Muslimin. I'm just a simple man from amongst the Muslims. And that's the humility of the Imam, not a false humility, but a deep uh, state of humility. And that is why he was raised up so high. There's a hadith that is actually a fabricated hadith. Ana Medina al Ilm wa Aliyun Babuha. I'm the city of knowledge, and Ali is its gate. But there's certainly the, there's a wisdom in the statement. It's not a hadith, but Sayyidina Ali has an incredible maqam amongst the Muslims. And uh, Alhamdulillah, he according to the the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, and I don't like to go into aqidah issues because they're, they're just, they can become very divisive nowadays, unfortunately. But what I was taught was the best people are the Prophet and then the four rightly guided Khilafah in their order. Uh, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, and then the ten Mubasharin bil Jannah, and then the people of Badr, and then the Bi'atul Radwan, the people of the Bi'atul Radwan, and then the rest of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. And then when they get to the Tabi'een, some say Hassan al-Basri and Sa'id ibn Musayyib, but that, that pretty much stops there. Um, Imam Malik radiallahu anhu actually preferred Aisha, I mean Fatima radiallahu anha, over everybody after, um, uh, after the Prophet, based on the hadith of Fatima being from the Prophet, he said, لا I don't prefer anyone over a piece of the Messenger of Allah. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Uh, again, alhamdulillah, they're all Khulafa Rashidun, Mahdiyun, and we should love them all. And uh, when I said that he married him to the most righteous, uh, in Arabic that would work. It, um, you know, nas. Salahan, which would not omit other people being uh, like Abu Bakr and Umar um, Please, could you give what is the hukum of the new social and sexual life of Muslim in UK and US, in Europe, in which men living with girlfriends? Well, there's there's no hukum. The hukum, the old hukum, uh, living with girlfriends is as haram today as it was yesterday and 1400 years ago. It's the same same situation. Uh, what is the substitute or the solution? It's called marriage, and it's, it's, it's worked since the beginning of Bani Adam, and there's no reason why it shouldn't work uh, anymore. Uh, could you please possibly explain the underlying phrase, بِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ فَمْ أَوْرِجَانَ قَوَّمُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءَ بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا This means that the men are ma maintainers, qawwamun means a maintainer, somebody that looks after uh, the women. Um, and I want to emphasize rijal, Allah didn't say at the kur qawwamun ala al-inath, that males are caretakers of females, Allah said rijal. And Abu Hayyan al said, not everybody that has a beard is a rajul, right? E even a goat has a beard. <laughs> So the word bima um, anfaqu, this ba here is like a sababiyah of because of what they were spending. So that, you know, Allah has given a man an opportunity to gain a reward by spending on his wife. The Prophet ﷺ was asked by a woman if a woman supports her husband, which in some of the Imams is cause for fasqh al-zawaj, it, it abrogates the marriage if the man's not supporting the woman. Um, the Prophet ﷺ said she has a reward twice. She has a ajr marratan. And there are women that are qawwamat uh, over men. 
and there are some women that are beating their men as well. It's certainly not as often as the other way around. And, and we have to fear a lot. And I'll tell you, in the old days, women had recourse to qadis, and they don't anymore. So we should have fear of Allah in how we treat our women. Because there's Muslim women oppressed all over. And, and don't, the feminists are gaining ground because there's a lot of very dissatisfied sisters with how they're being treated. And people like Fatima Mernisi are going to convince a lot of sisters because, you know, they're, they're seeing a lot of really bad behavior coming from the men. Uh, Again, this asking about Shia, I mean, I, I, I am, uh, you know, from, from, inshallah, from the people of Sunnah, Minahid Sunnah, and uh, the people, the, the Shia, um, according to the traditional Sunni position, a certain groups of them, like the Ithna Ashariya, uh, are, were, are considered Fusaq. Um, in terms of Aqidah, if they speak badly about the Sahaba, people like the Zaydiyah, which are the Shia of Yemen, who are not Rawafid. Uh, in fact, they're called the Rawafid because they Rafadu Zayd, Ibn Hassan Ibn Ali. Um, imam Zayd was an Imam from the Ahl al-Bayt, and he did not, he did not, the, the Zaydiyah of Yemen did not believe that they, they preferred Ali as the first Khalifa, but they did not uh, they believed in the, the, the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, that it was a, a, an acceptable and a righteous Khilafah, but they would have preferred Ali being the first. And that, that's why they're considered Aqrab, the nearest of the Shia people to the people of Sunnah. And they have lived and cohabitated with Sunni Muslims for centuries in Yemen, with very few occurrences of problems between them. And also, really, the Shia, you know, uh, these issues should not be divisive issues. We have much bigger issues today, you know, than, than, uh, than getting caught up in these, uh, these things that we need to unify our ummah and then we can, you know, start deciding which furniture, put the fire out on the house and then we can start choosing what type of bricks we're going to build the new house with. But the fire, the house is on fire and we're all arguing about which television channel we should be watching you know, inside the house. And the thing to do is get out of the house, start helping each other with buckets of water, put out the fire, and then we can deal with these issues. Um, could you please tell us, uh, Muslim population, approximate? Well, Muslims are notorious for exaggerating. Um, and, you know, Mark Twain once read in a dictionary that there were 25,000 Jews in America. This was in the 1890s. And Mark Twain said, why, I know that many Jews in my county alone. <laughs> so he said he wanted to find out why that was. And he contacted somebody from the encyclopedia and he said, well, that's the number they gave us. And he said, but as far as I'm concerned, they usually lessen their numbers when it's politically advantageous for them. Now we do the opposite. You see, we say, oh, there's six, seven million Muslims in America. And then the Americans are saying, what? The Islamic invasion. <laughs> You know, instead of saying, you know, there's only a handful, don't worry about us, just get on with your drinking and your fornicating, we're just doing our business here, you know, don't, you see, get the house in order. I mean, we like to roar like lions, but, but we have sheep's feet. You know, it's like Aesop's fables. Uh, he has a story about a donkey that found a lion's skin. And he put it on and he used to run out in the road and scare the animals. And, and one day a fox came and he, and he saw the, the lion jump out and he ran away. But foxes are clever. They're not stupid animals. In fact, the Arabs call their children Tha'lab because it's a clever fox. So if you want to look like a lion, you better be able to roar like a lion as well. Because that's what scares the people when the lion roars, not when he yawns. And there's a hadith in Tabarani that the Prophet is to have been reported to have said, Fi akhir zaman al-mu'min an yaruga rawagana thalab. 
Towards the end of time, the believer should be clever like a fox. And there's a lot of wisdom in that hadith because like I said, foxes are weak animals. But what they have in weakness, they make up in intelligence. Now, the fox, there's another story in Esau's fables where the lion invited the fox into the cave to have lunch with him. And the fox said, I'm going to decline the invitation. And the lion said, why? Well, aren't you hungry? He said, yeah, but I see all these footprints going into the cave and I don't see any coming out. <laughs> and I think maybe I might be the lunch. And this is the thing about the Muslims. We're invited into the lion's cave all the time and we just want mosey in. Where's the lunch? Well, why you are. <laughs> So we, we really, we have to start being like the fox, clever, not stupid. Can a Muslim woman divorce her husband? Again, these are fiqhi issues, there's difference of opinion. Generally, the haq, what's it called, the haq of talaq is in the hand of the husband. Abu Hanifa radiallahu does give uh, a right, but it has to be stipulated in the marriage and things like this. But these are fiqh issues. I would prefer, again, that you go back to your, uh, the imams here school and many other problems in society of kufr, political system and so on. Do we just treat the symptoms of cancer rather than root out cancer by getting back to Dar al-Islam? where the Dawah islam will teach correct way of life, Islam to every child and implement Sharia to preserve five. Well, first of all, we have to deal with the fact that there really isn't a Dawah islam right now. Dawah islam is a, a place in which there is a khilafa and the hukum of Allah is paramount. That is Dawah islam And we're, it's problematic. I mean, this is an age of hayra, of confusion. The ulama themselves are confused. And, I, and I, I've heard the ulama tell me this themselves. This is an age where things aren't black and white anymore. There used to be Darul Islam and Darul Harb. And now Muslims are persecuted in the places that used to be Darul Harb uh, for worshipping, for going to Fajr, for growing a beard. And yet in the Kufar lands, they can do these basic functions with uh, very little molestation. It's changing. Unfortunately, the situation is intensifying, like in France, it's getting very serious. But um, again, we, I believe we need to have a Darul Islam in our houses before we get the collective Darul Islam. We need to reach a critical mass of believers that are implementing this deen at a social level and interacting amongst themselves and things will begin to change. But again, we just... You know, the best definition of madness I've ever heard is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And this is what Muslims have been doing for a long time. How can we teach our children Islamic knowledge when we have no Islamic schools or educational? This is a great barrier to parent. That's what I'm saying. Get out and make them. And that's the whole point of my talk. I, I, some people, I don't know if they listen or... Uh, but that's what I'm saying. That's what we have to do. I mean, what do we do, just sit around and wait till it happens? That's the propped up block of wood approach to life. You sit around and wait till somebody else does it. And then if there's some benefit in it, you'll go. It's just like the Prophet وسلم, said that people, if the, uh, that he wanted to burn the houses down that didn't go to Fajr and Isha because he said if there was a mutton, a piece of lamb in the masjid, they'd be there. Which is a proof they rarely got meat in those days. They didn't get meat a lot of times. But, see somebody said, you know, I have a hard time getting to Fajr. If you tell them, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you're in Fajr tomorrow, or 50 pounds, or whatever, you, they'll be there. They'll probably be there for five quid. The state of a lot of Muslims nowadays. But they'll be there. If there's some material gain, they'll be there. But, this is, you know, this is part of the state. Now, part of the, we have to establish neighborhood masjids and live together. Because masjids are meant to be close to the house and the place where you work so that you can do, go and do and pray in the masjid. Some people say religion is like opium. Religion only uh, something, dicks people and so on. So they say science is the way forward. Please give your opinion about it. Um, religion, you know, again, there's definitions of religion. The religion of this, I mean, they talk about religion being an opium. At least the religion they had before wasn't physical, material opium that destroyed their mind. Now what they replaced religion with is real opium. 
You see, I mean, Marx said religion, the opium of the masses. So what do they replace it with? Real opium. You see, really, what are they all doing out there to fill their spiritual void? They're all taking opium. And as far as I'm concerned, television is just a form of opium. That's what it is. It's, it's TV. Do they say TV here? Transcendental vegetation. That's what you do. You just vegetate. And there's been studies... Neurologically, you go into what's called a hypnagogic state, which is a passive state. It's a receptive state. You sit there and you let them fill you with all that filth and all that garbage. And I'll tell you something, I know most of the people in here, you can close your eyes and start seeing images from the television right now. Why do you want to put that stuff in your brain? I saw an advertisement for a movie said, there's scenes in this picture you'll never forget. I said, that's all the more reason not to go see it. <laughs> Because I don't want them putting scenes in my mind that I can never forget. SubhanAllah. During the talk it was mentioned women's right to choose the husband without the ruling system of Islam. Women cannot marry someone without the parents' consent. Whereas in Islam women takes the father to court. Then the judge can... Again, these are... I know the issues are here. You've got big problems in your communities about this stuff. But could you tell us the steps towards marriage? Do you have to be financially and mentally prepared and to approach a woman the process? Um, the Prophet is a hadith sahih من استطاع يا معشر الشباب من استطاع منكم الباء فليتزوج الباء means the, the primary meaning is the place where you live if you have a place where you can put your wife a, a maskan بوأك الله means like may Allah put you in a good place بوأك الله خيرا أو اجعل الجنة بوأك so the, the باء and then باء also means It also means the financial ability. Now we know that some of the Sahaba married with literally nothing. We know that. It's historically documented. There are situations in where it is wajib for a man to marry. If he fears fornication. Fornication is worse than penury. In other words, poverty will not take you to hell. But fornication is very uh, dangerous. So. You know, people just have to do what they have to do, but, but uh, the best situation is to go in with some stability. I know that one of the number one reasons for marital friction and problems is financial security. And what the responsibility of men is to, to maintain the, the natural state of sakina that a woman has. And if you want to get a woman into a disarrayed state, then create constricting financial environment for her because it's very unnerving for women. The Prophet ﷺ kept a year's supply of food in his house for his women. And that, that's just a way of like having them feel at ease about those matters because women are concerned about their children and, and they have major concerns and people should respond to that and be... We know the hadith of Hind asking if she could steal money from Abu Sufyan. <laughs> I know of men and women in this world who perform truly wonderful acts looking after disabled and poor people and kind people, but they are not Muslim. Will there be any hope for them? Will they still be in hell if they're good? So, Allahu ta'ala a'lam. We don't condemn anybody to the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the only thing He will not forgive is shirk. But Allah also says, Inna deen and Allah al-Islam. فَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ he, If whoever seeks other than Islam as a way, it will not be accepted from him. And he's in the Akhira from the people of loss. So, but Allah Ta'ala A'lam, the condition of people, again, we should not be concerned about other people's individual judgment. We could be concerned about whether we're doing good acts or not. Not about whether the Christians are doing good acts or not. We should be concerned what about we're doing. It's like they say, don't be concerned about what people say about you, but be concerned about what you say about other people. Because you have no control about what people say about you, but you certainly have control over what you say about other people. Since, for example, we don't have enough Islamic schools in the UK, if we take our children out of the un-Islamic schools, where should we take them? A really good place to start is your home. There's something, I don't know, in the United States, we can homeschool. And there's people that have proven that homeschooling is more effective academically than even the best schools in the United States. There's a book called Homeschooling for Excellence. 
that was put, written by two people who chose to raise their children in their house. They taught them the 15 years old, they took the high school, uh, they took the examinations to get into university and they had almost perfect scores and there were three of them out of the four at the time the book was written the fourth one hadn't completed his studies the the three had all been accepted to Harvard which is the number one dunya university in the United States now that though that's an outward you know that's just people teaching them the dunya sciences I mean really these schools People tell me in the United States, oh, our school outscored the Islamic school, quote unquote, outscored the public school by 10%. 10%? I mean, if that's all we're outscoring these people, then we're in bad shape. Because 80% of, in one study they did, 80% of students in high school in the United States didn't know where the Pacific Ocean was. Which is not a fardain. <laughs> You're not going to be asked about how high Mount Everest is on Yom Qiyamah. They fill themselves with all these trivial facts. Uh, these are so many questions. I'm going to take them, inshallah. Maybe I'll write a book. I, I'm, alhamdulillah, it's been good. Thank you very much for your attentive, and I didn't mean to be harsh on the ladies with the children, um, I, but it's just hard to concentrate. Uh, I would just say to end, you know, my visit to, to the UK and seeing the condition of the Muslims, I would say that the conditions here from what I've seen, and I know my uh, stay here has been short, less than three weeks, but there seems to be that there's very serious conditions. And I read in the Independent in Liverpool an article about children beating their mothers. And I started the article and I'm thinking, look at these kuffar, you know, aql al walidat and I was saying, alhamdulillah, the Muslims, you know, and it turned out the kid that was beating the woman was a, from a Muslim family, his name was Ahmed. And uh, he was the a result, the woman was English, the husband had been a Muslim and then he divorced her and then went and married a Muslim woman and just dumped this kid and this kid was filled with rage and he was beating this woman. And you know, this is part, one of the, one of the things Muslims do, they sow, they sow quote unquote, sow their wild oats. Some of these Muslim men, they go out and sow their wild oats with non-Muslim women and then leave offspring and then they go find a nice, good, virgin Muslim wife after they've been messing around. You know, really, they should be disgusted and ashamed of themselves, these people. And I don't know if any, I hope none of those type people are in this room, but there's a lot of them out there. I'll tell you that much. And I know the brothers in Liverpool have told me that when they do da'wah, they get all these women that have been married to Muslim men coming screaming about what a sick religion Islam is. Because that was their experience of the Muslim men. And don't forget that people, most people, they judge things by behavior. When you talk about the Jews, you're not talking about the Jewish religion. You're talking about how the Jews behave. When you talk about Christians, you're not talking about Christian ideals. You're talking about how the Christians behave. And that's what we associate Christianity with and Judaism and Hinduism people associate religions with the actions of the followers of the religions and that's why Allah warns us about being people upright to be an example shuhada ala nas how can you be a witness for people if you're not upright if you're some pathetic example of depravity yourself and so really people are going to have yom qiyamah it's, it's a scary day yom yaqumu nasu bi rabbil alameen it's a frightening day and people should think about it and start making some muhasaba. At the end of the day, start reflecting on what we've been doing with our days and how we've been treating people. Really. In the, when it says, مَا سَرَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرُ قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We didn't pray. وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُطْعِمُ الْمُسْكِينَ وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ The tafsir of كُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ We were followers and we weren't leaders. And Muslims are supposed to be leaders. We're supposed to be a'imma. We made from them imma. Yuridu an yamunnu. 
على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ويجعلهم أئمة ويجعلهم الوارثين. Allah wants to take those who are based in the earth and make them leaders and inheritors, but they have to change themselves. Being a based in the earth doesn't that that's not we're not permanently you know we don't have to stay in this condition. And Muslims need to get out a new mindset, get out of this depressive, pessimistic. We don't need to stay in this condition. We have all the tools for raising up and becoming a great ummah. But what we have to do is look at the models of success and then emulate them. If you want to be successful in anything, you have to see people who've been successful in that thing and look what they did. Why reinvent the wheel? If we want to be successful, we should look at those who went before us who were successful and do what they did and we'll get the results they did. And the one of the most beautiful things the poet ever said from Andalusia, تِلْكَ أَثَارُنَا تَدُلُّ عَلَيْنَا فَانْظُرُوا بَعْدَنَا إِلَى الْأَثَارِ These are our remnants. So they indicate who we were. So look after we're gone at what we left behind. If you want to know who we were, look at what we've left behind. And it's pretty frightening what our generation is going to leave behind for the future generations of this ummah. A bunch of slogans and pamphlets. Islam is the solution. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrat aynin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. Jazakallah khair. I hope inshallah many of us, if not all of us inshallah, will benefit from what Imam